Hey guys, this is John. All right, this is the first match of the 2018 Pro Chess League season, and I am playing for the Minnesota Blizzard. Thank you, first of all, to those of you who voted for the Minnesota Blizzard. You might recall a few months ago we played a qualifier to get into the Pro Chess League because we didn't qualify based on our 2017 score. So we got in the top uh, three for voting in this qualifier, and then we managed to beat out New York and San Francisco thanks to uh, many of your votes. So we deeply appreciate that, the Blizzard. And I'm going to record my commentary as I play this first match for the Blizzard. It's starting in about four minutes. As you can see, there's no webcam, which is unusual for my videos. I used to make videos like this back when I started my YouTube channel, but uh, very rare nowadays for me not to be on camera. But the only reason for that is the league is using an anti-cheating measure where we all have to log on to uh, this website, I think it's called Zoom Meeting. I've got it open in the side of my screen here, but they use your webcam for that. They want people to be on camera just as an extra anti-cheating measure, which I think is a smart idea. So I'll just be doing the commentary like this. Let me show you our pairings that we have. Yeah, this ought to work. Okay, so we're in the Atlantic division. There are how many divisions? One, two, three, four, I believe. Yeah, so we're in the Atlantic division. And tonight we're playing one of the toughest teams in the entire league, I think, the St. Louis Archbishops. And here are the pairings. So the format for this consists of 16 games total in a match, four versus four. And you play everyone on the opposing team once. So as you can see here, in the first round, I have White against Darius Swirch, well over 2,600. In the second round, I have Black against Vladimir Fedoseev. Easy game, right? I mean, the guy just came second at the World Rapid Championship. <laughs> Easy work. Uh, and then White against Duncan Shepard. That's by far their lowest rated player in, in their team, in their lineup tonight. And then finally, I'll have Black against Yaroslav Zerobuk. Another very tough guy. So you can see that they've gone with a lineup where they have three extremely tough GMs and then one uh, lower rated player who, you know, you, if you want to make a team that's dangerous on three boards you kind of have to have a lower rated board four because the average rating of your players must be below 2500 feet eight we're going with a more balanced approach you can see that everyone on our team is an im andrew tang is a gm elect he's going to get his title confirmed at the next feed conference which i think is next month so he'll he's effectively a gm but we've got daniel gurovich he's one of our out of state acquisitions in the off season i believe he lives in georgia uh, strong im i played him a couple times Actually, do not have a good record against him, OTB. He's always tough. Um, and myself, and then Sean Nagel, who is um, a local IM here, many-time Minnesota State champion. You might remember on some of my videos, I've talked about him before because we played many times, and he's actually been a tough opponent for me historically in local matchups. So I don't know how this is going to work out playing and commenting against high-level players at the same time. If I do horrible in this match, I may not be able to do this for future matches. <laughs> but, you know, I thought this would be entertaining and interesting for you guys. And I wanted to do something. Um, and also our team wanted to do something as a way of saying thank you to voting us in for the 2018 Pro Chess League season. I mean, I think without you guys, we wouldn't have stood a chance in the voting against New York and San Francisco. So we are one minute away from the match starting. I'm just watching Amon, Amon Hamilton's game against Unieski Quezada. So they're battling it out right now. Looks like a tense game. I will close this game once the match starts here. I'm not feeling well today, by the way. Uh, I posted on Twitter <laughs> like about, uh, I don't know, an hour ago that I had two Jersey Mike subs recently. It was actually yesterday. So I, I got back from this tournament I was playing in Charlotte, North Carolina. I didn't have any food in my refrigerator. But I did have a coupon for a buy one, get one free sub at Jersey Mike's, which is a sub shop. It's like Jimmy John's or Subway, maybe a little more high class than Subway. And the first sub was amazing. It was a tuna sub. It was all loaded. It was really good. And I took the other one home, but I decided not to save it for today, like the next day, because subs tend to get soggy, especially if they have mayo and stuff on them. Uh, here we go, by the way. So I made the mistake of eating both of the subs yesterday, and in the past 24 hours, my stomach has just been doing somersaults. Like, it, it was not a good idea to do that. All right, so I'm playing Swirts. I'm just going to play mainline D4. 
By the way, I'm not saying that as an excuse, but just to provide some context to <laughs> how I'm playing today. So another guy that the St. Louis Archbishops have on their roster is Fabiano Caruana. He defected from the chess bras and now plays for St. Louis, so expect to see him in matches too. A5, okay, let's play A3 and just challenge that bishop. And now the idea is you want to take with the queen so you can try to get this knight to C3. Can I draw arrows? Yeah, I can actually. Okay. So yeah, my idea is to try to get this knight to C3 ASAP. Um, I think I'll just play it right away. Don't see why not. Also going to turn down my volume just a little bit. There we go. Okay, and he plays D5 immediately. I actually think this is some sort of theory. So I'm thinking about taking or playing e3. Um, let's play e3, just so that this bishop can't come out easier. I mean, if I insert this trade, the bishop might be able to develop to one of these squares a bit more comfortably. So this sort of looks like a queen's gambit decline style position where the dark square bishops have been traded. And we've inserted these moves a3, a5. I think I'm happy so far. I mean, I don't think white is all that much better, but it's it's a comfortable position. I can play this. Okay, now I am thinking about taking on d5 and then playing bishop d3. Yeah, let's make that trade. Over the past several months, I've been focusing on playing more practical chess, just making quicker decisions, trying to bank time, not obsessing about details in positions and just playing essentially the first move that comes to mind in a lot of cases. Uh, okay, so here I'm thinking queen c2 because knight e4 looks like it could be irritating. So yeah, let's stop knight e4 and also take aim against the h7 pawn. And I think for now my plan will be to simply castle and hopefully play for b4 at some stage. He plays c6, just a stabilizing move. Yeah, let's castle. And I'll try to pull up the games from some of my teammates after my game is finished, if there's time. We got to score heavily on board four, obviously. We got to try to beat their board four, Duncan Shepard, pretty handily to have a chance in this match. So queen e7, that stops b4. I could play rook b1 to try to threaten b4. I could also play a semi-waiting move like h3 or something. He also might be trying to go for knight e4. I guess that's a definite possibility. I think I like rook b1. Yeah, I'm just going to go for this one. I mean, it makes it pretty obvious what I'm intending, but... That's the principal pawn break for white in these structures. If this knight was not on f3, I might be able to go for the plan of f3 and e4. I mean, there'd be some question about my e3 pawn safety because, again, the dark square bishops have been traded. So usually, you know, white has a bishop on g5 or f4 that's protecting that pawn. But with the knight on f3, more often you're going for uh, a pawn break on the queen side if you break with a pawn at all. Sometimes you can even try to outpost this knight on e5 if you get a chance. Okay, so I have a slight time edge, still very early in the game, but I'm happy to be on move 13 and still have plenty of time. I remember when I played the Pro Chess League last season, I wasn't even recording any of my matches, and I was constantly getting in time pressure. You guys know I've talked about this many times in my videos, but for me, time management is uh, the number one thing I found when I play, and I'm really focusing on just being more practical with that. So knight e4. So if I play b4 and we get a swap... Could bring his rook into a3 maybe, but then I can simply play like rook b3. Yeah, I could also I could also maybe take here and then bring this knight back to d2. He'll play knight f6 against that. B4 trade. Hmm, I'm not, I'm not sure about that. I think I'm actually going to play b4 right away. I think I like this a bit more. 
pre-move that capture. Yeah, so we get the trade. Now, if the rook comes in, maybe then I'll take here. I'm considering it. Also think about that. But by virtue of having played rook a, b1, I am allowing this rook to come into the position, but I'm, I'm kind of hoping it's a blank shot. I mean, he is hitting c3, but if I tend to c3, I don't believe the rook is all that effective on the third rank. Meanwhile, my whole strategy with this pawn break b4 is this so-called minority attack. I'm trying to use less pawns on the queen side to attack more pawns, attack black structure here. If I can go b5, capture on c6, inflict a pawn weakness, and hopefully exploit this later in the end game, then um, that would be mission accomplished for this pawn structure. Okay, so he plays knight df6. So often the idea there is if b5, he wants to go c5. But I think in this case that isn't too scary, right? b5, c5, I guess I, I can take, and likely he'd have to take with the knight. I could maybe think about this move right now. Just trying to have some influence down the C file. Yeah, because B5, C5, he does weaken D5, but otherwise the position is fine. So maybe Rook FC1, maybe I just beef up my setup a bit more. F2 is a little loose, but I don't think he can do anything there. I could still play that rook a3 move, though. Hmm. Now, you know what? I'm going to go b5 right away. Let's just go and play in the most straightforward manner. So I'm expecting c5 because I don't think he wants to let me take here and just give him that. Uh, as far as I can tell, almost permanent weakness on c6, so look for him to play this move. It'd be nice if I could play knight takes d5 in response to that, and then win as e4 knight, but he has enough defenders here. So I think after c5, I'm going to take, and then after queen takes, probably play rook f c1. And I figure if there's trades, that should benefit me because of the d pawn in the end. So now I'll take, he takes with the knight. Hmm. Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's what I meant originally. Because queen takes would have ran into knight takes e4. So yeah, knight takes was expected. Now I can still play that move I was mentioning, rook fc1, but there's other options too, like knight d4 makes a lot of sense. Maybe bishop f5, although I don't think I want to let him trade this bishop so easy. I'm just going to play knight d4, I think. Any tactical tricks I need to be aware of here? Like bishop takes h7, knight takes d5? Probably not. Hmm, you know what? I could play this move and threaten knight takes d5. That's interesting. Hmm, that might not be so bad, actually. You know what? Let's do that. Change my mind. So threatening to take here, because I'd have the discovery on this knight, that would win a pawn. And if he reinforces that knight, plays b6, then that weakens the c6 square. Maybe I can threaten something to do with that. I spent about a minute on that last move. That's a bit long, but we are on move 18. Okay, he does play b6. So knight d4. Still liking the look of that. Yeah. Hop in. So these are the big weaknesses for black in the position. At the moment, it's hard for me to ratchet up the pressure on those. Uh, also, the c6 square is weak. But maybe in the future, I can generate play against those points. I think it kind of depends where his bishop goes. Probably one of those squares to guard c6. 
maybe I can think about repositioning this bishop, like bishop e2 to f3, place queen d6. Mm -hmm. Okay, I should watch out for something involving knight g4. That could happen. So considering bishop f5, uh, h3, h3 does look pretty normal. h3, bishop d7, looks like an expected continuation. If bishop f5, you might just take it. Although after queen takes, am I all that unhappy? Probably not. That seems fine. Hmm. What else here? Rook a1 crosses my mind, but doesn't address this threat. Although, I guess technically I could take on a8 there, and my king would escape. But probably he'd trade first and then play knight g4. And if I play g3, I'm not sure how bad that is. It's probably okay, but... I don't know about allowing it. I think I'm just going to play h3. Looks reasonable. Just stop knight g4 in any case. Might be helpful later in the end game. Evaluation wise, I think the position is pretty close to equal. I mean, I'd like to say I have some sort of edge in playing against this pawn, but I know it is hard to break down that, that blockade on c5, and the pawn on b5 could be a liability too. So, I mean, if I had to choose, I would take white, but I think objectively the position is pretty close to equal. So g6, so that stops any business of mine trying to use the f5 square. Okay, so I'm thinking about rook a1. Or maybe moving my light square bishop. I could try to reposition it. Just maybe go here. It's actually kind of an attractive plan, I think. Yeah, let's play like that. This knight's guarding f5, so no worries there. So maybe I can put it on f3 and try to attack d5. Come up with a different angle to attack that pawn. I also might dispute this file. I'm not sure yet, but maybe rook a1 somewhere. Oh, I don't even know if I mentioned the time control, by the way. It's 15 minutes with a two second increment, if you haven't figured that out already. Okay, so bishop d7. Thinking about disputing here, but also just thinking about playing bishop f3. So bishop f3, my only concern would be if he could somehow take over the a file, but I don't see how he's going to do that. If he brings a rook into a3, I can just play my rook over. That should be fine, and then queen b2 to follow. Yeah, I don't foresee any issues there, so... Actually, maybe I want to keep it there just to guard d3. Hmm. Yeah. Let's do this first. Might throw this rook on c8, try to put pressure down the file. And if he plays like that, where do I put the queen? Because I feel like I will have to move the queen. Maybe a2. To try to stack some pieces against d5. I'd have my knight and my queen hitting that point. The logistics of getting in bishop f3 could be tricky. But a2 is uh, looking like the best square, as far as I can tell for now. Also, d1 does come to mind. 
or even still b2 i mean i just have to watch out for that maybe i go rook d1 we'll see what he does he does play rook c8 could also try for some sort of maneuver like this later But let's just do this for now. I'm just not sure what my next move will be. Because again, I can't go here because the fork. Maybe rook d1. Or possibly this knight a2 plan. Yeah, knight a2 is pretty interesting. He plays h5, okay. Looks like just a sensible space gaining move. Hmm. Hmm. It's also knight a4. If I want to try to trade this guy. And possibly even knight c6, I'm noticing, is a, a move to consider. Because after the trade, there might be bishop b5 at the end. Uh, even that I'm not so sure about, though. Decisions. Okay, let's go rook d1. I'm going to go for this plan of trying to play bishop f3, cover the d3 square. I think playing knight into e4, one of the knights into e4, would be the, the principal way of trying to object to rook d1, since I have less of a, a presence down the c file. At the same time, I don't know that I'm that worried about that. We shall see. Say knight e4, trade, trade. I wonder if I can even play knight c6 at that point. Maybe. Mm, probably it doesn't work. Well, maybe it does. I don't know. We'll probably both be under five minutes pretty soon. kind of like that line I just mentioned. I think tactically it works. I see a line where it gets down to an even rook end game. Rook and four versus rook and four. I won't quote it because it is kind of a long line, but we'll see what he does. And if he plays something neutral, bishop f3 could be my next move. Or maybe this knight c6 move I was mentioning. Trying to get at d5 sooner or later. Thing is, I don't see too many compelling options for him other than putting a knight on e4. Because the last move he made, h5, like that's a standard improving move, just giving the king a bit more space. But he can't really favorably push another pawn. I mean, I don't think he'll play g5. That seems a bit rash. He plays rook e7. Okay, so now knight c6 probably isn't working, but I can play that bishop f3 move I was talking about. Hmm. 
And there's other options like rook a7 maybe. Uh, queen b4, queen a3. I think I like bishop f3 though. I'm going to play that. I don't really get rook e7. Maybe he was trying to take the sting out of knight c6, but it seems slow. So I'll just try to increase the pressure on d5 and see what happens. Rook e5. Okay. So knight c6 just immediately comes to mind, but does that work tactically? Knight c6, bishop takes, pawn takes. And if rook takes, there's knight b5, that's nice. But what if queen takes? Queen takes, I still have knight b5, maybe. And he can double his rooks on the e file then. Be nice to play knight takes d5, but I don't think that's working. Probably not. Hmm. So maybe I can prepare knight c6 somehow? So I really want to play that move. Take, take. But how is that going to work? Uh, maybe knight a4. Knight c6, take, take, knight a4. And I can just play rook e6 then. Yeah, that doesn't amount to anything. Hmm. I mean, I could play it as a pawn sack and try to go after his weaknesses. Knight c6, bishop takes, pawn takes, rook b1, maybe? Yeah, maybe rook b1. Hmm. Still not sure. Gotta, gotta play something soon, though. I think I might play rook b1 right now. Yeah, I'm going to do it. Seems like a transparent move, but I don't think I'm doing much down the A file. I'd, I'd love to just land this and be able to take the b6 pawn after all is said and done. Again, he can he can try to land a knight on e4 now. He's going to go for that. Okay. Hmm. Well, let's do this now and see what happens. Bishop takes, pawn takes, and I'm hoping knight b5 and maybe the threat on b6 gives him headaches. But there is g4 coming. I don't know that I properly considered this g4 plan. We'll find out what happens there. I mean, maybe he can just play it right now. Yeah, he might be able to. Because on knight b5, he can always go to e7 and guard the rook. And I think he's going to try to put the pawn in on g3 and weaken my e3 point. Yeah, he goes for it. Hmm. So I think I need something strong right here. So my king is going to be opened up. Hmm. 
Hmm. Well, I think I'm just going to start with taking and then play the bishop back. 254. If g3, maybe here. And I can try to take with the queen. I mean, you figure he'll have to attend to c6 at some point. And b6 is hanging. But I'm just a little worried about my king safety now. There's not that many pieces around my king. I mean, he could think about rook h5. I'd play g3. Takes with the rook. Okay. Yeah, knight b5, queen e7 probably. And then it almost looks like I have to play g3 soon. No matter what. Mm, I'm going to play rook d4. Try to get another piece, like swinging across. Maybe some pressure right here. And if g3, I think, again, this, this bishop f3 move might be helpful to control h5. Although now my queen won't have access to this rook if ever I play my knight somewhere. So down a pawn, but, you know, he's got weaknesses. Time is dwindling. Still a lot to play for here. You might think about playing knight e4 again. This move I've, I've been mentioning for a while. But still, somehow I think g3 is likely. Although then after bishop f3, I, I feel safer around my king at least. Still not great, but it's probably playable. He's burning a lot of time now. This is only two second increment, so let's see what I can do if he gets in time pressure. Okay. So knight b5 I'm considering... Uh, rook b4 maybe is a move. Yeah, rook b4 is interesting. Rook b4, he might play that g3 move, though. Hmm. Rook b4, g3, can I take on b6? Ugh, that looks dangerous. I don't like the look of that. All right. I think I'm just going to go back. I don't like it. <laughs> Ooh, now g3, though. g3, bishop here, take, and I'd have to take with the king. Uh, okay, not losing yet, but... Not great either. Well, let's do this. Take with the king. Now, I'm just I got to keep an eye on these squares. He might be trying to land a knight on one of those soon. For the moment, I'm covering, but barely. If he plays rook f5, he'd be threatening to take on c3. Hmm. Okay, what now? Knight b5 is obvious, but I don't know if it's that great. 
No, let's try it. Time getting low. Queen backs up. Hmm. Like D4 maybe, stabilizing move. Let's do it. Hmm. There, knight c3, king d2. Okay, I'll try this. Not sure of the consequences. Knight c3, king d2 is what I'm looking at. If he takes on d1, I take on uh, c6. Both very short of time. He's got a clear attack, though, and an extra pawn. Knight in. All right, I think I got to take that. Just a lot of painful looking moves he can try here. Painful for me, that is. Ah, he takes that with check. Okay. Let's take. Yeah, he's playing some good, no nonsense chess, I would say, at this point. I think he can just take here. Didn't really see what else to do, though. I'll try for some back rank, like queen c8 idea. Queen c8, rook h1, knight f5, something along those lines. Okay, we'll give a check. Rook g3, maybe. Queen b5. Yeah, this should definitely be over somehow. Rook c4. Yeah, I think that's going to be it. I'll just play it out till checkmate, but rook a1 is mate. Okay. So he got us with that g5 g4 plan i didn't see that coming that was a nice idea so trying to push against this bishop so maybe here is where i should play knight c6 if knight c6 is going to be good it's probably on this move i mean even when i played rook b1 i was talking about how i thought that move might be slow but i couldn't figure out after takes takes and then queen takes how to capitalize because he has all these weaknesses, and it looks like I have, should have some good discovery, but it wasn't uh, clear to me what that discovery was. For example, if I go knight b5, hitting the rook, also threatening knight a7, he can double up. And I'm still struggling to get my pawn back. There's other knight moves. I mean, knight takes d5, also threatens this, but he can just take with a rook, I think. Take, take. He's got two knights against uh, a rook. Should be better for black. So, okay. Lose that first game. I think after he got in G5, G4, I was clearly worse. I mean, I was trying to find some way to wiggle out of that, but nothing was really coming up because always the possibility of that G3 move destroying my king side is painful. I mean, here I could play G3 myself, but I think that too is just going to lead to a lot of suffering. All right, so I'm waiting for the next round to begin. I'm just checking to see if any of my teammates 
are still playing. I think that should be basically the end of it because that game went pretty long, but you never know. There might be some other games going. Yeah, I don't see any of my teammates still in there. So we'll just wait for a second until the next round begins. Yeah, overall, not a bad game, though. I think I like the position I had at the opening. Felt like there was a tiny pull. This is a big debate in these positions, whether to play B5 or not. Allowing C5 and, you know, it's sort of... Um, this can happen a lot in Queen's Gambit decline positions, even though this came out of a Bogo Indian. Uh, this sort of structure. I think he showed his experience well. There should be a way on the main Pro Chess League website to see the standings. So I'm going to go back to the start here. You know, this is like... Oop, don't want to see that. Okay, so we got one point in the first game. <laughs> Not ideal because it was probably against their board four. So that means our other two guys lost. Can you guys see that? Yeah, you can. Okay, good. I'll just leave this page up so I can refer to it in between the games. I like this league, though. It's a great way to get in some practice. These games are unrated, so you can try stuff that you wouldn't normally try. I'm mainly using it as a way to practice good habits for OTB chess, because as you guys know, I'm currently trying to get my Grandmaster title, working towards that. And a big component of getting my Grandmaster title will be just playing lots of games against good players, Grandmasters. So I mean, the fact that I get to face three very strong GMs, including one over 2,700 in Fedoseyev, in this match is just um, it's just awesome. I mean, I don't even care if I lose all the games as long as I'm learning something. And the league's real strong this year. We've got elite players playing. Magnus Carlsen played for the Norway Gnomes today. Even though he's on a rest day at Tata Steel, he still decided to play this event for his team. So that's something I want to be a part of always. Just trying to see if there's anything else I wanted to say about this. Time management was good in this game. I mean, we got in time pressure at the end, but that's expected when you go 40-plus moves in a 15-plus-2 game. Um, I was hoping I could <laughs> swindle him somehow right at the end. I mean, Queen E4, maybe he did overlook Queen C8, which would be awesome if uh, he played King G7 here because then I would have Knight F5 check and go back and pick up his Rook. Maybe even something better than that, like my Rook joining in on the H-file if he goes there with his King, but... Yeah, he can't be played queen e8. These guys have such a refined sense of danger. He's not going to give me some easy swindling opportunity like that, even when he has less than 10 seconds. So when I look at this game later, after the heat of battle, I think I'm going to focus right around here after rook e5. If I can make knight c6 work or maybe do something else in view of uh, g5, g4. That must be why he played rook e5, by the way. So right here, if I had played knight c6, or sorry, if he had played g5 right away, and I go knight c6, take, take, I guess from his point of view, the issue is I now have three attackers on d5, and he only has two defenders. So rook e5 must have been preparation for uh, knight, uh, knight c6, anticipating knight c6. That's good thinking. Okay, the game still hasn't started, so I'm just going to... Why don't we look at Amon's game again? So who's he playing this time? He's playing Turizaga. Amon is down several pawns. He's down three pawns in this position, but he can maybe get one of them back, like the A pawn. He has a dark square bishop that looks pretty darn good. Maybe he's arguing he can, yeah, target two pawns potentially, take C4 and A2. Oh, wow, he had, has hardly any time. He has four seconds left. I wonder if Amon is commentating uh, this, this match as well. Probably not, because I know the chess bras have Miodrag Pravrunovic as their main commentator, so he's probably playing. All right, and here we go. Let's close that game. I'm playing Fedoseyev now with Black. The big gun, Vladimir Fedoseyev. Stick with the main repertoire. It'd be really nice to score an upset in one of these games for the team. 
Because if we don't score any upsets, we're losing this match handily. <laughs> okay, queen c2. I'll take... Queen c2 is a pretty no-nonsense approach. Play all these standard moves. Put the bishop on e7, and then castle. Um, been a while since I played against this setup. I think I've had this exact position before, and I played knight e4, if I'm not mistaken. And I kind of like that move. Sometimes you can also play b5 in these setups, but that involves a bit more theory. So I think I will play knight e4, just to try to stop him from playing e4. Plays bishop f4, all right. Okay. Let's go rook c8, maybe in preparation for this move. I'm definitely going to have to take a bathroom break after this game. My stomach is feeling a little bit better at this point, but <laughs> just all day, man. Last 24 hours, really, like I was saying. It's just uh, like this uncomfortable feeling. So I have a compact position. White has more space and possibilities of pawn breaks in the future, but for now I'm stopping e4. I may be looking to play b5 now that this pawn is protected in particular. Possibly c5 with my rook opposing his queen. Time management's fine. Let's keep trucking. His username is BigFish1995. That's great. I do not think he's a fish. I think he's a shark. Okay, a6 is the obvious move here. Yeah, let's do it. Just stop queen takes a7. Briefly thought about knight b6, queen takes, and trying to harass his queen, but I don't think that works with this bishop on f4. Yeah, I'm curious what he'll do here. I mean, usually in these setups, you want to try to dislodge this knight from e4. Thing is, if he takes, though, after takes, I'm pretty happy because it's hard for him to attack my bishop without offering a trade of bishops. If he plays knight back to d2 at that point, I'll swap, and he might eventually get an e4, but with those trades happening, uh, black's a little less cramped. I should have good counterplay. I have sometimes seen white try to sneak in knight h4 here, but I think in this position it just doesn't work. Knight takes c3, followed by bishop takes h4, and I'd win a pawn. Although maybe white would have some sort of compensation there with the two bishops on the open board, but I don't think he'll go for that. I bet he'll make a rook move. He might reposition this queen. Like, I think queen b3 makes some sense to attack b7. I could see him doing something like queen b3. And then on queen b6, swap the queens and then move this knight into e5. Maybe that's a possible plan. But on queen b3, I might play b5. And he's thinking a little bit now. And he plays knight e5. Okay. So double attack on this. First line to consider, trade, trade, take. Bishop takes and go from there, but he'll get in e4 after that. I actually don't know that that's so bad for me. I mean, maybe I can just play bishop d6 at the end of that line. That actually looks pretty, pretty okay. Could also move this knight or maybe reinforce it like this. Hmm. 
So take, take, knight takes, bishop takes, and then something like bishop d6. I mean, I suspect he's a little better there. e4, bishop g6. But that's a, that's a solid position for me. Don't think I should have too many issues there. The other thing I can do is try to reinforce this knight. Hmm. Nah, I'm going to trade down. Just going to try to make some swaps. Yeah, take this now. Oh, maybe g5 was worth considering too, but knight takes d7, I guess he always has. Yeah, and then play like this. Because in principle, those trades should be decent for me, having uh, less space compared to him. Do that. And maybe someday I can play f6 and bishop f7, get the bishop active this way. Again, like maybe a few moves ago, move 13, where I spent a minute and a half, I could play something more dynamic and think a little bit longer to make it work, but... I just want to play fast, logical moves. Let's pre-move this capture just in case he does it. He's probably looking at favorable ways to keep the tension between those two bishops. I do remember in Anand's playoff against Fedoseyev, you know, not like I can really criticize a fantastic player like Vladimir Fedoseyev, like way stronger than I am, but he did have problems in that tiebreak, which was a blitz tiebreak, I believe, when Anand was just playing fast against him. It's almost like Fedoseyev uh, kind of panicked in a couple moments when Anand just kept firing out the moves. So <laughs> maybe I can try my own version of that. We'll see. Okay, so he's going to keep the tension for now. And on f6, his idea is probably to trade and then play e5, which which does actually look favorable for him. So he'd love to take with a rook and pressure this pawn. And if I trade here and then play queen c7, I think he's saying he's going to stick this rook in on d6. So I'm thinking just play queen e7, and maybe um, try to force him to make this trade. I know I lose the tempo in doing this compared to if he traded on d6 right away, but it seems best to do that without playing f6 yet. Now I can look for a moment to try to break somewhere, maybe with c5 or e5 in the future. So a bit of a time edge, nothing major to write home about yet, but helpful. Here, I think h6 would be natural. Again, if f6, there's probably that e5 move, so don't think I want to play that. And he's not threatening h5, but I still feel like I should play h6 just for future, for future um, assistance and giving my king an escape square. E5 is kind of interesting as well. The mm, thing I'm not sure about E5, though, is after trade, trade, F4, I'd have to give a check on C5. Uh, maybe I could actually take C3. I don't know. Hmm. No, I'm just going to do this. Keep E5 in reserve. I don't have to play that move yet. Because after e5, I'm not sure I actually want to take on d4, so maybe I should just hold off on that move entirely. Again, like I spent 52 seconds on that move, but that's probably a move I could have played in 5 to 10 seconds. I 
I like playing these compact pawn structure positions. We just have few weaknesses. Yeah, your opponent has more space, but especially in a fast time control, I feel like that extra space is sometimes a burden. As I've talked about in my videos, like you have to maintain that space, uh, cultivate it, use it somehow to your advantage. And that's sometimes not an easy task when you have little time. Whereas when you have a compact position, you can just maneuver behind this. You can, as my friend Robbie Adamson says, just shuffle. He once called me the shuffle master because I really like maneuvering in positions like this. He's looking for some sort of plan, but I mean, what can he realistically attack here? I mean, he could continue trying to push pawns on the king side, but his king will become weak if he does that. He could try to attack b7. I think something like rook b1 would not be unexpected, but um, if he abandons the d-file, like I might strike back with one of these moves at some point. Wow, so he's going to force that through. That is unexpected. So if takes, takes, what if I just play e5? Because that's my first instinct. And yeah, he's got to pass d-pawn, but c3 is weak. Could also just play e5 right here, but then maybe he goes c4, is what he's saying. Perhaps a little better for him. Okay. Let's take that way. And then if takes, again, he's taking here. I probably don't want that. So, yeah, e5. Kind of hate to have my queen blockading, but I think it's fine. And on this move, I was thinking go here. Yeah, should be all right. If he trades and then takes on e5, I win c3 at the end. It's not optimal to have my queen being the blockader of the d-pawn, but I think because I have good pressure here and the possibility of a trade in the future and maybe my rook coming to d6, this should be okay. Should be decent for me. And he's going to make that swap immediately. Hmm. I wasn't really expecting that approach. Is he going to play h5 after I take? Maybe. But I always have bishop c2. Ah, but then maybe I get pinned. Huh. Hmm, so maybe there's issues there. Let's think for a second. So if take h5, I can play f6, but then rook here. Looks like a problem. Yeah, that's no good. Hmm. Okay, so I might have made a mistake in going into something concrete here. I'm still not sure how bad this is. I feel like there's a way out of this. All right, so if, if takes h5 here, uh, he has stuff with uh, this, and then he's threatening to check and then win eventual bishop e4 check. That's pretty annoying. Hmm. And I can't go to d3 because I get pinned like that. Awkward. Very awkward. All 
Okay, so if I take h5, f6, rook here, could I take the pawn on h5 after that? I'm going to try that because I don't, I don't think not taking the pawn is really a viable option, so we'll see what happens based on this f6 move. I mean, if I don't take the pawn, I'm just down a pawn for hardly any compensation as far as I can see. Okay, so let's go here now. He calculated that, apparently. Now, do I take or play bishop takes h5 first? Bishop takes h5 would be my instinct. Bishop takes, he takes here, I take d1. Then he checks or something. Can I always get my rook behind this pawn, though? And if I take, 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 check, king here. I don't like my king getting pushed out like that. Yeah, that's not good, especially with his pawn coming up. So let's do that. Let's see what Mr. Fedoseyev has in store for me. Okay, check. King f7 looks totally normal. And I also even have that bishop f3 move coming up if I need it. Yeah, I think I gotta go here. Maybe he'll just check and go after this pawn. Hmm, I don't know. I feel like this bishop f3 resource is vital to my defense. But as it stands, I'm currently up a pawn, by the way. Because I got two pawns in that transaction, his c3 pawn and his h5 pawn. He only won my e5 pawn. And we traded a pair of rooks. So it's possible I could throw this bishop f3 move in somewhere. Kind of force him to uh, bail out and go for an even rook end game. And if he doesn't trade the bishops, after bishop f3, you know, if ever, let's say he does something like that, he'll have to reckon with a possible mating net. Rook c1, rook h1. So let's hope all that calculation is accurate. The other question, though, is what happens if he just pushes? He's going to check. Okay. So king g6, I, th I think, is the move I want to play. Yeah, let's do that. And still, I'm locked into bishop f3. Let's say d6, bishop f3. Uh, let's say rook takes b7. Then I probably take and get behind the pawn. That should be all right. And then I can start trying to make use of my majority on the king side. Yeah, that should be, I think, acceptable. Hmm. Ah, okay. So if f5, he's going to go rook here. King g5, f4, what happens then? King g4, he checks here. Wow. Whew. <laughs> okay. Did not see that line, but it makes a lot of sense. I mean, still, I've got that extra pawn, though, so if necessary, I can give it back. So f5, he checks, king up, f4. Yeah, 
That just looks good for him, I think. Uh, maybe I have bishop c2 at the end. Bishop c2, could that save me? f5, check. King up. Maybe not even king up. Maybe I just play... Hmm. f5, check. King g5. Well, it's a lot to calculate. I'm not sure. Well, I think I'm going to play this. I think the line I'm seeing is is all right for me. So I'm thinking go here because after f4 check, king h5, the g3 pawn is always loose. I feel like that's really helpful. There, there. Take... Yeah, okay, let's do that. Now after f4, I don't want to go here because I think after this, I mean, even that line might be okay for me, but I think it's better to play just king h5 right away. King h5, bishop takes f5, and then I'm thinking bishop c2. I could also take on g3 check first, but I'm worried about king f2. Rook f3, king e1. So, king h5. And then bishop c2. Maybe the saving move. Yeah, let's do that. I don't know. I'm not sure if he was really um, threatening much there, but bishop c2 just seems like a nice resource. I can't go to g4 because then I would get mated. But bishop here looks favorable. If he trades, my rook is immediately on the second rank, and maybe I can infiltrate with my king. If he plays g4 check, that pushes my king up. He's never going to mate me with that construction. I mean, I do still have to worry about his d-pawn, but... Okay, hmm. He says, I don't care about my uh, g3 pawn, <laughs> which I can't blame him because this is such an asset. Hmm, tricky business. I'm thinking check, king f2, and then maybe king h4. Yeah. I think I got to start with a check. And getting the king off of a light square just seems highly desirable. So I'll play that. But how am I going to stop this guy? That's a big question going forward. Okay, now bishop here, maybe? Yeah, probably. I got check ideas also coming over here, ideas. Hmm. Bishop h1. Uh, Bishop h1, he has f5. I could check. 
but king e3. And my bishop is running out of squares. And that pawn is ready to run. Hmm. This is tricky. Hmm. Not sure I see a real viable line here. Might be forced to check. But that just loses, right? Check. Well, I can check on g2 and see what happens. I mean, it pushes this king up to e3, but I don't, I don't see anything else. Because the f5 check after my bishop moves is so powerful. Oh, I can't even go to b1. I got to go to c2 or something. Well, then my bishop's going to be totally out of the game. Let's go here. Again, don't really see a, a better option. Ah, you can just push check. Duh. Yeah, that was bad. Yeah. Okay. Well, I'll try to <laughs> play on a few more moves, but I think that's effectively over. Got to get back to try to stop his pawn, but. Not much to do there. I guess I had to play bishop h7 instead. But, yeah, that, that should be losing. I only have one pawn for the piece. Might be able to pick up one of these pawns, but the main thing is his d-pawn is very strong. He's probably looking at moves like rook d4, just getting behind the pawn right away. Bishop f7. Yeah, also probably good. Yep, I think that one's over. I'm going to resign. Oh, sorry. I think I offered to draw instead of resigning. <laughs> but let's just see that position. Rook b4 was very good. After rook b4, I think I'm just losing because all of a sudden those f5 ideas start lurking. f5, the discovery. So say I play like bishop h1 here. f5, check. I guess I can block with this. No, no, that doesn't work, though. Because um, trade, trade, and then f6 at the end. And he's going to take here. Or just push, make a queen next move. So if we go back to that position again. I think I played probably the only move to try to save the bishop. Check. But then ironically, I dropped the bishop on the next move. So maybe I got to go bishop h7. Yeah, because then at least f5 doesn't lose the bishop. But I think with the strength of this d-pawn, I should be losing. I mean, maybe just d7 here and keep these threats in reserve. Yeah, that should be losing. I just don't have a lot of coordination. Even though, even though I'm up a pawn, it uh, seems out of reach. That said, though, I think this sequence was very interesting, and I had chances. I was thinking also about king g4, but couldn't figure out if it was beneficial to lure his rook to g6. King back to h5, bishop takes f5, because he'd be protecting g3 then. My king looks pretty boxed in, but maybe...
Okay. So, double-edged game towards the end against Fedoseyev. I have a feeling somehow this is all fine. Again, I'll check later. But I bet... I bet I should be doing fine. I mean, maybe even right here, if king f7, let's say. You know what there, you know what there is also to consider is king here, take, and then bishop f3. Because again, I was mentioning this possibility of the back ranker. Ooh, yeah, why didn't I go for that? That just seems much better. Does he even lose in this case? Is What does he play? I mean, a check just allows my king up. That doesn't seem to help. So, wow. Actually, this serious case to be made for that. If he can't take the f5 pawn, then that's a big boost to my position. f5 here. And if king here, then this. And he's staring down. Checkmate. No good way to stop it. So I think that too was a missed opportunity. I played king g5 because I thought it would actually be helpful to make sure his g3 pawn is undefended, but that was probably incorrect, especially since I didn't even take the g3 pawn on the next move. I looked at this line, but wasn't sure about this position because if I take on f4, then he plays check and picks up the bishop. Okay, yeah, I had my share of chances there at the end. Well, let's see if there's any other games going from our team. Again, looks like everyone on our team is done. Check the standings once more. Um, let's see. Four and a half, three and a half. Okay, we made up a little ground there. That's good. So we must have got an upset somewhere. Now just waiting for the next game to start. All right, I'm going to make that bathroom break. Take that bathroom break. I'll be right back. Okay, I'm back. So I'll be playing their board for next round with white. Must win game. So might as well just talk about this game a little bit more. But yeah, the opening went fine. I was a little bit worse, I think. Nothing much, though. Just um, less space compared to white. But as I was explaining, I really like these compact positions where... The onus is almost on white to do something. I did underestimate this h5 idea. I didn't see h5, that he could play it there with the rook covering it from e5. But after f6, the play gets to be forcing. And black is up a pawn here. It's just, can I deal with this d pawn? Or as it happened in the game, my awkward king position. <laughs> I didn't manage to do that. Can I add the engine in? I know there's a way when you're observing a game... I can submit it for analysis, but when you're observing a game, you can look at the live engine evaluation. But maybe once you've played a game, you can't do that exactly. But to my human eyes, it looks like king h5 was just a big missed opportunity by me. Because, yeah, after this, how does white deal with the threats against their king? g4 never helps. Bishop g6 doesn't help. Just pushes my king up the board. And these pieces are now just too awkwardly placed. 
So I think that means after king h5 that white would not be able to take the pawn. And if that's the case, like, that's a huge boost to me. So say white plays bishop g2, might be the only move. Then I can always play this bishop f3 move and get behind the pawn. Yeah, black's probably just better here. Say take, take, here, here. Uh, maybe it somehow fizzles, like take, take, take. Yeah, this looks like a certain draw. Something like this. Okay, so missed opportunity, but good game. Two more games left in this match. Seeing if we can look at a game while we wait. Let's take a look at Unieski Quezada versus Ivan Saric. Two very strong players. Okay, so black is up a pawn. Also, black has some tricks here. Maybe. Such as Rook E1. Rook E1 could be a threat. If the queen goes to g3, then there's rook h1 luring the king away from defending the queen. So that's something that black will have to reckon with. So if rook takes c7, rook e1. Oh, it's going to play rook e6, on the other hand. So if takes, takes, white's pinning their hopes on that e-pawn. But black immediately plays the rook over, playing for threats against white's king, I think. Yeah, so now this rook might join in at some moment. White's rook on d4 is a concern. It's not doing very much. Black's king looks a lot safer than white's king for the moment. Probably take that to start. Unless black can set up some sort of mating net, some crazy mating net. But I doubt it. Takes. Now which way to take? It takes that way. So maybe introducing some rook takes h6 plans in the future. So if like this rook comes in, queen queen d4, but there's maybe rook takes h3 or queen g3 for black too, actually. Yeah, what about this move? Doesn't that almost just win on the spot? Or is white going to go here immediately? Yeah, white probably has to play that right away. So rook 8a3, rook takes h6 check. If g takes h6, queen d4, and black, I think, might even lose there. They might get mated. Uh-huh. So Quezada just decides to guard the h6 point. Hmm, this is sharp. Black doesn't have that much time. Nor does white. That looks like a good decision, though, in mutual time pressure. And white's going to play a rook takes h6. Okay. Huh. So after a queen takes h6, the trade of the two rooks for the queen, I don't think black can ever lose that. If pawn takes, though, what's happening? Rook here, check. Or queen d4 first. Probably rook check, king g6. Ah, and then queen takes b6, I guess. All right, well, that's interesting, but I've got a game to play against Duncan Shepard. Got to win this one. That is absolutely key. Okay, so he's playing a Slav. Just debating what I want to do here. I'm going to play a Fianchetto line that I've played a bit. I actually played this in my most recent tournament in Charlotte. He plays bishop f5. Okay, 
Now I think I want to go knight c3. Delay the fianchetto of the bishop to g2. Now let's chase this guy. And there's some ways for white to try to grab the two bishops and put a lot of pressure on black's position with this approach. Bishop e4, yeah. So f3. So he's hoping to prove that f3 is kind of a, a weakening move. I'm just trying to remember. I think I play queen b3 here, if I'm not mistaken. Or do I take on g6 first? Or even take on d5? This is where these lines get a bit confusing. I think I'll play queen b3 first. Just most flexible, and usually black plays queen b6 or queen d7 at this point. And if queen b6, I think at that point I'll take on g6, just so his bishop never comes to c2 after a trade of queens. And after I take on g6, I might go for e4, trying to expand in the center. So queen d7 has, is his alternative here. So this player's a national master, even though he was listed at 1,900. But I think that's FIDE ratings, what they list on the Pro Chess League site. So yeah, he's probably 22 to 2,300 USCF, I'd imagine. So he's debating how to react to this queen b3 move. So on queen b6, he does play queen b6. I think I like trading. Trade immediately. And now c5 is the usual reaction. Yeah. And he can either trade or go back to c7 if he wants to keep it a little more complicated. After queen c7, I do get in bishop f4 with tempo, though. That's the downside. I think I saw a game that reached this exact position. Recent London chess classic game, actually. Matthew Cornett playing the white pieces. So again, time-wise, doing well out of the opening. Let's try to keep that up, keep the pressure. This decision he has to make is largely a matter of style, I think. If he takes on b3, he's content to play a passive, slightly worse position, although he's solid. If he plays queen c7, I think he's also solid, but he has more dynamic potential. Potential for counterplay with the queens on, I think. Although he will lose a tempo after bishop f4, like I was saying. So I, I bet most people in this circumstance take on b3. But... 
yeah, White's very happy to have that half open A file. I think the game that I'm thinking of where Matthew Cornette played white went trade, trade, knight a6, rook a4, looking for b4, b5, knight c7, bishop f4, king d7, and then I want to say g4 from white, which probably rules out knight h5. And white slowly started strangling black. So that's the model that I'll follow if he plays that way. Okay, this is very promising for me, the fact that he's thinking so much on this move and also that queen b6 move. It's just like once you get below 10 minutes, you're not all that far from 5 minutes, which after which you're playing a blitz game. So time management is just so critical in these games. He trades. Okay, so he's going to go for this line. So I could play bishop f4 right away, but then he gets his knight into b4. I think it's better to play rook a4 to try to rule that out. So yeah, let's do that. And I can continue playing rapid fire. That's the, the nice point about this. I was probably hoping to get that in and then maybe support it with a5. So hopefully lots of easy moves on the horizon for me. Bishop f4, e3 at some point, open this bishop, g4, maybe march my king over to g2 to protect this pawn further, bring this rook over. I can play on all wings. The queen side is the most obvious place to play, I think, because I have that pawn on c5. I've got a lot more space over there. But usually black winds up playing a6, and they only have that one weakness on b7. It's sometimes hard to take advantage of that. So look for me to maybe at some point switch the play to the center or the king side. And he's again gone into a pretty long think here. Minute 47 on move 8, 3 minutes on move, move 10, and counting on move number 12 here. He's going to break in the center. Mm -hmm. My first instinct to react to that move is just e3, but I guess then he's going to play knight c7. Or maybe take first. So, okay, so I, I can take here if I want. Then he's going to go knight d7, I suppose. b4. Knight takes e5. Uh, maybe then bishop f4. Or e4 even. Hmm. I think taking might be my best approach right now. Yeah, probably. I like how this position could open up for me. Let's take... Force knight d7. I don't think he wants to play knight take c5. I get two pieces. Yeah, now b4. Protect that c5 pawn. I, I like the c5 pawn more than the e5 pawn. And now after knight takes, then it will be kind of a decision time which way I continue. Do I play e4, bishop f4? Kind of leaning towards e4. e4, knight takes here. Maybe he takes on h2, but um, no, he's going to have a lot of problems keeping his queen side together if he does that.
Yeah, e4 looks pretty natural to me. Yeah, let's go for it. Just dare him to take here. Hopefully he'll burn more time thinking about that. I mean, I know these points are loose, but I am lining this up. That's a big deal. Also, I'm threatening d5 in a lot of circumstances. I'd rather try to crash through in the center and on the queen side right now than uh, maybe allow him to like settle into something after knight c7. I feel like I have the initiative right here, and I, I got to capitalize. I see some lines where he could try to sacrifice on c5 or b4 and try to grab these two pawns and maybe this one, get three pawns for the piece and try for some sort of confusion. But that's a lot to calculate, and it doesn't look promising for him. So let's say knight takes f3 check, king f2. And then let's say rook takes h2, rook takes h2, knight takes h2. I take on a6, he takes back. I can take on d5 at the end. Yeah, I really like how that's starting to look. Because these pawns could just be a huge issue for him. He might have like a 3 on 1 on the king side, but I think my b and my c pawns, my activity over on that other wing is going to be the bigger factor. He's going to be in severe time pressure soon if this keeps up. I mean, on the surface, it seems reckless the way I'm playing, but in my mind, it makes perfect sense. Open the position for the bishops. Try to take advantage of his awkward knight on a6. In making that evaluation, I think I'm playing off of my experience with uh, the black pieces in these Slav setups quite a bit. When white gets the, the bishop pair like that, the biggest danger in my experience is when they open the position at a moment when you're underdeveloped or you're just not expecting it. It's possible I could even try to trap his knight on h2 in the future, but I think more likely I'm just going to go for that straightforward win of the knight on a6, mess his pawns up. Hmm. So knight takes f3, king here. Rook takes h2, rook takes, takes. Probably take on d5 there. I think I like that. Maybe not take on a6 yet. Take on d5 first. Because I can see if he castles queenside, maybe bishop h3 check is a good shot. And then king g2. Like I was saying, his knight might be trapped on the h2 square. All right, so he's going to go for this. Let's go here. And he takes. Mm -hmm. Okay, so if knight takes, then he's probably going to take here with the rook, I imagine. Okay. Yeah, and I'll end up winning the a6 pawn, but I think he'll play king d7 at the end is his idea. All right, yeah. That's reasonable how he's playing it.
still kind of like my position in that line, even though I would be down a pawn, because, or no, I would be down a pawn, yeah, one pawn. But he'd have weak pawns on a7 and c6. I guess just a matter if I can break through there. But I could try to disallow this option. I could play maybe h4 here. But that gives him a chance to play f5. But then I do take on a6 again. Trade, trade, king d7. Mm, he's a little bit better anchored there, isn't he? Okay, so knight takes e4 or bishop takes a6. Those are my two main candidate moves right now. Hmm. Also, I'd throw in h4. H4 is another candidate. Does allow F5, though, like I was saying. But actually, maybe that's good for me because H4, F5, then I take, take, take. And if King D7 at the end, I have this Rook D1 move. That could be really helpful. But can he go to c7, maybe? Hmm. Now I'm thinking about h4. I think I'm leaning towards that move now. It also gives him the chance for knight c7, though. Takes and then back up his knight. Mm, I'm just so active there, though. That looks pretty good. Okay, so I'm spending some time on this move, but this is an important decision. I'm going to go for h4. We'll see what happens after that move. He might just back this knight up. And let me take here. But I should have good compensation in that case, I think. So keep the pressure on. Even if this is not the best move, it's going to keep more pieces on the board, give him more to think about. That's my theory. <laughs> So let's say knight c7, knight takes e4, maybe knight d4. Uh, I could play bishop f4 at that point, or maybe develop this light square bishop. I'll be on that a pawn. Almost seems like I'll have to play a6 in the future. I think you should play knight c7 rather than speculate on f5 and bishop takes. And I know he's got two connected pawns there, but his queen side looks very fragile to me in that line. Okay, so two minutes and 10 seconds or so for him. I don't see any other candidate moves to worry about other than this or f5. And I don't think knight takes c5 is going to be too good. Maybe he's thinking about this move. He's going to go for f5. Okay. So now I want to be ready to play my next few moves pretty quick. So take, take, take. 
King d7, check, King c7, Bishop f4, King b7. I'd love to play rook d7 there, but it's not quite working. I could also take, take, and then play rook d1 first. But I think it's better to, to go with that other line. Yeah, I'm going to do this. I don't know that he wants to allow me all these checks. I mean, his king does come over. He's going to go back with the knight. Okay. So he's going to try to land this knight on d3. I see. So maybe king e2. King e2 or king g2. Could also even play rook d1, maybe, and sack the exchange. Hmm. I'd like to hold this pawn, though, whatever I do. King e2, knight d3, knight a2, maybe. King d7. Hmm. Kind of feel like I'm going backwards in that line. I might go for the exchange sack. Rook d1, knight d3, take, take, take on c6. It's pretty radical, but seems to be called for. And with his time, he, he might not be able to cope with that. Yeah, let's try it. This is his best, best piece by far. So I'm making it pretty clear if he goes knight d3, I'm going to take it. And he might not want to allow that. Because then after I take c6, I'm also on g6. The c pawn looks pretty dangerous. His coordination is lacking, I would say. I gotta watch that d pawn, however. I don't I want to make sure he doesn't play rook d8 followed by d2 once he establishes this here. Hmm, he doesn't bite. Okay. So I could force him to bite if I wanted and play bishop f4. But maybe he's arguing that he's just going to get castled if that happens. Okay, now I'm thinking about king e2. Maybe I switch up my plan a bit. Is he looking for g5 maybe? I don't know. Hmm. No, I'm going to stick with this. Yeah, let's do that. King e2, I didn't like g5. And then he might be coming in down the h file soon. So let's, let's force him to a decision. So now I think he has to speculate on this. And we'll see what happens. It's going to go g5 anyways, okay. So take rook down, king here, I guess. Yeah, let's take. Go here. Probably he'll take this pawn, but I'm thinking that I jump into d5 and try to attack him. Hmm. 
It's also rook c7. Rook c7 is better. Knight d5, rook d8 is what I don't like. Rook c7, though, could maybe hit the a pawn in some circumstances. Hmm, I don't know. Rook c7, rook d8. Yeah, okay. I'm going to do this. Rook d8 and probably b5. Goes rook there. Okay, so if I come in, what's your plan? That just looks strong to me. Bishop d8, rook takes g7. Uh-huh. He needs counterplay bad here. Whoa, that allows knight c7, maybe. Among other moves. I mean, there's rook f8 too. Maybe just rook f8 followed by g6. But I can also check king here and then take here. Which looks like it should be pretty crushing. Hmm. Ah, I can also just play knight takes e7. That's probably by far the easiest move. Yeah, just knight takes e7. As if rook takes, then check, and I pick up his rook. So king f8 probably, and knight takes f5. Okay. Yeah, knight takes e7, he just resigned. That's a lot of threats to deal with. So I think if at this in this position after rook c7, his best chance might be rook d8. Rook d8 and then try to do something with the d pawn in conjunction with this rook, like rook here at some point. So I really tried to blitzkrieg him this game. I noticed his hesitancy in the opening. He's spending a lot of time starting with this move, queen b6, and then even deciding whether to take on b3. He spent three minutes. So I have a feeling some of this wasn't sound this whole idea of sacking the exchange on d3, but I knew it was going to put a lot of pressure on him. White has a clear initiative. Black has to come up with some accurate defensive moves. So I'm happy with how that one ended, but yeah, it's uh, an open question whether he could play rook d8 and try to survive here. He might be able to. So this game got done pretty fast. Let's take a look at some of my teammates. Um, let's look at Andrew's game against Darius Swirch. Okay, both in time pressure. Andrew's got 30-some seconds. Darius has a minute more than him. Looks like white is better here, but I'm not sure. I say that because white does have the outside pass pawn, which looks more dangerous than the C pawn, but these knights are kind of tangled, aren't they? This one can't ever go to C7. Ah, so maybe Andrew's planning to go bishop to C8 and just attack this knight. Ooh, but he has to watch out for knight c7. Bishop c8, there's knight c7, and if takes, there's the old back rank. So I bet Andrew makes a... Yep, and he does. He makes a luft move first. h6, so his king has an escape square. That's good thinking. Okay, so can, can white take and then play knight here? 
and just try to win the exchange back. Maybe that's what Switch will do. Because then King H2 is useful because there's no check on the back rank. If White had done that uh, move prior, like take, take, knight here, take, because the king is still on G1, black would have check on C1. So I bet that's what White's going to do. Still, though, I think Andrew is looking all right. Just has to worry about that A pawn. Hmm. Rook there. Okay. And Andrew instantly responds with that. So still, this is on tap. And White doesn't have much time. Let's go, Andrew. GM elect Tang. Ten seconds. Sacking the exchange. Ah, because he does have that. No, but he doesn't because then A5 will be hanging at the end. Ooh, all of a sudden. <laughs> so the knight's going to go back here. No, okay, Andrew's playing for the win now. Definitely. Maybe rook a7. Set up knight c7. Yep. Five seconds for white. That's not much. He's just going to try to stabilize, I think. Okay, Andrew also doesn't have much time, but... Got a bet on black here. Like roulette. And chess when you're under 10 seconds is kind of like roulette. Okay, offer the trade. He's got to take that. So now the big question, can white maintain this A pawn? Okay, rook there. And you're just going to approach with this king. Try to, at some point, get rid of that. Confident king d5. I like that. So now you can take... Check here, probably. Probably come here. Yep. King f8, so he avoids any knight d6 business. This is still tough to convert for Andrew. Um, he needs to keep this c pawn. And for the moment, it can't move because he's pinned. So he's trying to get behind it so he can move this rook away and then push. But Swirtz is no pushover. He's not going to make that easy. Okay, now this could be a threat, so probably f4. Goes for g5. Huh. Ooh, swing this over now, right? Ooh, I thought rook f8 was good there. Maybe not. I don't think that trade of the h for the g-pawn was in um, Swirtz's favor, because now his structure is just always fractured. Andrew's just so confident when he has little time like this. He's just, he's one of the best. Rook g6 now probably. Nope, back. Ooh, 96 maybe. Mm, 96 is a bit of a bummer for... Ooh, okay, he might win this. Knight h3 holding for now. Probably swing over here. You can see how fast Andrew's playing. Like, he's just not letting Swirts ever get above five or six seconds. That's awesome. Rook d4 or c4. I think White was trying to line up some sort of attack on the eighth rank there. Ooh. Ooh, he barely got that move off. Yeah, never letting him get to the eighth rank. This pawn will just be pushed again. Watch out for knight f7. Check. Probably check again. Yep. But there you go. Oh, I think Andrew's got this now. Rook d1 next move. Rook d1. There you go. Nice, Andrew. Well played. That was a huge point. We needed to pick up that one. Uh, let me just see if any other games. I think that's the last one from... The third game of the match. So if we click back over here, let's see, hopefully this updates. Mm, that's still the score from the previous 
previous one. But that was huge. Andrew winning with black against Swirts. We needed that. I'm going to be playing black against Zerubuke in the final round. And it'd be really helpful to know the score just in case you need a certain result, like if a draw is okay or if you have to push for a win. Always good to know that stuff in a team match. But if we picked up at least two points there, then um, you know this this is going to be close. I don't know how Gurevich and Nagel did in the last round. So, at minimum, this will be a one-point match, hopefully closer. Let's see who else we got. I'm just going to tune into a game here. Uh, how about Alex Lenderman versus Lei Kuang Liam? That seems like a decent one. The Montclair Sopranos, who Lenderman is playing for, versus the Webster Windmills, Lei Kuang Liam. We're approaching the two-hour mark in this match, so if you watch the Pro Chess League in the future, I think each individual match probably going about two and a half hours. You can plan for that. This position looks normal for uh, an English. There's a trade of the light square bishops on G2, I think. I think it looks equal. Black setup is logical. White has the d5 square, but other than that, I don't think there's too much uh, wrong with Black's position. So Lenderman's going to try to push on the queen side. I'd really like to get a, a draw or a win in this final round. I dropped those first two games and took care of business with White against the lower-rated player last game, but um, I'd love to finish with an even score if possible. This game is a bit slow right now. Just going to click over to another one. Um, let's watch them on again. So that match is still going. This must be the last game of this match because I think, yeah, the Chess Bras versus the Miami Champions, this match started right before ours did. Naman's in time pressure, but it looks like he has an advantage here. More space. Black does have a... Protected past C pawn, but Mon's coming at him on the king side. G4, G5 coming up. I wonder if G5 is a decent move for black here. Pretty radical, but pawn sack after takes, maneuver this knight here and try to get it into E5. I would certainly consider it, because I think otherwise Amon's going to play G5 and support it with H4. And black may never get a knight to E5. That's a big problem piece for black this knight. It'd be a tough position to win for white. Mon will have to break through at some point. But for the moment, he looks like he's in control. Just checking to see what the opening was. It was a uh, Benoni. I also sometimes play this line of the Benoni. And there he goes, g5, so establishing a pawn there. All right, and this is the last game against Cruel Yarrow, Yaroslav Zerubuk. He plays b3 on move one. Okay. <laughs> I didn't do a whole lot of preparation for this match, so when I see moves like b3, I'm glad I didn't. I'm just going to stick this bishop out here because it does pin the pawn. And if he plays knight f3, I can take and double up his pawns if I want. So, yeah, I think I'm going to do that. He takes that way. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's just play e6. I'm just aiming for a solid structure. Yeah, I'm going to fianchetto this bishop too. Get this bishop to g7. G4 
just to oppose this guy. And I've already got several pawns anchored on light squares, which should be good in playing against this light square bishop. There's d4, probably just castle. Okay, now, where do I want my knights arranged? Knight bd7 followed by c5 was my instinct here. If I go c5 right away, he might be able to take. Although I, I suppose then I could play knight a6, couldn't I? Hmm. Yeah, that's possible. Hmm. Just not sure I want to open the position quite yet, but you know what? I think I'm going to try that. So I feel like I can very quickly attack this pawn. That's a direct challenge to his setup. And if he doesn't take me, then I'll take him and stick my knight on c6. And I'll have harmonious development. So, all right, doing this. Stops b4 as well. I can just take on b4 if he plays that. If bishop a3, I can think about queen a5 or... Maybe some other move like, um, I don't know. Well, I guess I'd have to watch out for c6 in that case. But I think queen a5 should be a fully viable resource, and he doesn't even bother defending the pawn, yeah. Okay, let's take that guy. Rook c8 coming up. And he's going to open the position, right. He probably figures this might be his uh, best chance to try to capitalize. Okay, just go rook c8. Can't put a rook on c1 because I do have knight d3 against that. I'm running out of Starbucks, so this match is ending at an appropriate time. <laughs> Takes on d5. Now, I can take with the pawn and try to deny his knight some useful squares, but I think knight takes d5 would be the more standard capture. Knight takes d5, we'll get a trade of these guys. He's probably hoping to be a little bit better there in the resulting position. I am going to take that way, though. So I don't want to just let him play against the um, isolated pawn for free. So we'll do this. And let me click over. I just want to see if they updated these uh, standings. It's 6-6. Six, six. Okay, it's 6-6 six, six in this match. That's good to know. He does play knight c4. Mm -hmm. So his knight can make its way to e5. But I'm thinking about playing b5. Like b5 maybe followed by knight c3. It's interesting. Just try to gain a real strong foothold on that c3 square. b5, knight e5, knight c3. Hmm. Queen e1 maybe. And then I do have knight d3 though. Knight d3 is important. I actually like the look of that. I'm going to play that way. Queen d4 I don't think I have to worry about. I can always just, I don't know, block with the queen or something. Or even knight blocks. So this is an ambitious move, but I think it makes a lot of sense. I don't really want his bishop attacking my pawn on b7 in the long run. And if I can play my knight into c3, I'll always have b4 as a way to support that knight. Pretty close on time. He's got a bit of a time edge.
I actually taught a chess camp with Yaroslav this past summer, so I got to know him a little bit. Very booked up guy. Knows a lot about the Nidorf Sicilian. He was telling me about his files in the Nidorf and how extensive they are for black. He's one of those believers in the, the Nidorf. Favorite defense of Fischer, Kasparov. The Cadillac of chess openings, as some people call it. So still expecting knight e5. I mean, another moves, bishop takes d5. I don't think I should have any issue there at all. I could take with the queen if I wanted. Because if ever we get down into a, an endgame with equal pawns like that, knight's on board and he no longer has a bishop, he's got those doubled f pawns, so I don't think I would be any, any worse, even though that d pawn is isolated. Wow, he does take, though. Just as I was explaining why I'm not worried about that move, he does it. <laughs> Yeah, I really don't think this should be anything, though. Is he going to go knight d6? Maybe takes knight d6 is his plan. Hmm. Yeah, could be. But even that, I could just play rook b8. So takes... Maybe he trades first. Trade, trade, knight d6, rook b8, rook d1, rook d8, take, knight e4. Now his rook takes b5 there. Okay, mm, I see your point. I see your point, sir. So maybe I have to take with a pawn. Pawn takes, queen d4, check. Queen b6, or just king g8, king g8 probably. Hmm. Just going to look at that line one more time, but queen takes, I guess I'm no longer liking as much because of either the trade and knight d6 or knight d6 right away. Hmm. But if I play pawn takes, queen d4 check. Uh, maybe queen f6 then. Pawn takes, queen d4, check, queen f6, trade, trade, knight d6, rook b8. That's a little bit different. Maybe more so in my favor. Yeah, I'll take with a pawn. Intending this block. And hoping that after a trade on f6, my king being closer to the e pawn will help out. Or the D pawn, rather. Because, again, if the position stabilizes and he's not able to win this pawn, then long-term, I think I'm doing well with his double left pawns. So, queen D4. There's also knight E5, but knight E5, I might even push this pawn. So... Play like this. Could also play ninety five here if he wants. He might do that. That would be interesting, because then he might be claiming that d5 is weak, and if this knight moves, he might snatch a7. So actually, knight e5 could be a good move for him. Don't think I have to panic yet, but I'm seeing some lines where I might be down a pawn and have to play actively to compensate for it. Say knight e5 if I go rook fd8. 
he can go here, threaten my knight. And if knight e6, queen takes a7, should be in white's favor. Uh, maybe I play knight d4 there and try to threaten knight e2, but yeah, it should be better for white. And he is going to play that, okay. So how do I keep this together? Or if I'm going to give up a pawn, how do I do it in the most active possible way? I could play knight d7 and try to take on e5, but I would just be down a pawn without too much compensation. Maybe I can get the rook into c2, but otherwise not much. Hmm. So maybe rook here, rook here. I could also use the other rook, though, as the other thing. I was thinking knight e6. Let's say he does play rook a c1, takes, and then rook a8. Nah, it doesn't seem like that's so great for me, though. <clears throat> hmm. Hmm. Maybe that line is tenable. Yeah, it might be playable. Let's try that. And he instantly plays that. So he's probably trying to keep this A2 pawn protected. Seems to be what he's up to. So knight here, queen takes A7. Or knight d7. Also thinking about that again. But it's an admission of being worse if I play knight d7. Not that I'm not worse already, but uh, offering to trade, that is. It's a tough call here. And I can't protect my knight with my queen because that just opens me up to discoveries. Okay. I think I'm going to opt for this move. It gives up a7, but let's go for something with this. Try to attack his queen. Got to scramble now for compensation. If I look at it optimistically, the only pawn that he's up is one of these doubled F pawns, if we cancel out these two. <laughs> it is an extra pawn, though. So I got to bank on my D pawn, maybe my pressure on A2, possibly this knight jumping in somewhere in the future. Knight takes F4 is not working. It would be nice, but it doesn't work. Think about just rook back. Or this rook over. Only thing is, if I put a rook here, knight c6 will be threatened. But maybe that's what I gotta do. Yeah, actually, let's go here. If queen here, I'm gonna play knight d4, I think. So he goes back to e3 instead. 
fair enough. Okay. Maybe so knight c6 is a threat, no doubt. So maybe here. Love to play b4, but just not working. Hmm. <clears throat> I'm going to play the rook back to a8. Wasn't seeing a whole lot of good moves there. Try to keep an eye on this pawn. This knight does cover the c7 square, so he can't infiltrate. And I am preventing knight c6 forking the rooks, but still. Uphill battle. So I'm hoping I can get in like B4, uh, maybe double up, attack this at some stage. Again, would love to get my knight active, but he's doing a good job of controlling my knight jumping squares. Okay, he brings the rook in. This knight is now pinned, at least. Got to try to extract a silver lining from all of this. <laughs> hmm. All right, let's push. Try to get that deep on doing something. So if queen f5, can I let him take here and then just play d3? Threaten knight d4. Queen f5 seems desperate, but <laughs> I'm sort of at a loss what to do here. Yeah, let's try it. Let's roll the dice. My queen was not looking good on the f6 square. It was pinned. I always had to watch out for knight g4. Let's see if we'll accept a trade. My pawns get messed up, but maybe I can do something with my d-pawn. Followed by knight d4. And if he doesn't trade, I'll always have the option of trading myself and forcing his knight back. So he does take the trade. So now my rook is handy here. At least it stops his rook from becoming active. So he does something sensible, I think. Yeah, brings the knight back. This knight having access to b4 is super annoying. I'm going to try to challenge him. Just rook on the c file. Is he going to play rook c1? He does. Okay, I was thinking maybe I could swap and play knight c5. So otherwise, I mean, if I come into c3, let's say, trade, trade, probably his king just starts approaching. 
Yeah, I don't see any tricks there I can use. But if I swap a knight c5, maybe I can kind of slow him down. Let's try that. Let's try to bring my king up like this. I can think about playing b4 somewhere here, but the timing is going to matter a lot with that move. So I think first I got to play king e6. It's b4, knight d3, and I would lose the pawn on game. So yeah, get this closer. And now king d5. Or b4. Probably king d5. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And he says, I can win the pawn end game. But can you? Take, take, b4. If this there... Or actually, I just wait with my pawns, rather. And he'd be up like several pawns, but he might not be able to win. Is that possible? Take, take, b4, g4. And then I just wait with my king, let's say. That would be pretty crazy if that worked, but it might. Mm, on the other hand, that seems optimistic, but maybe, maybe. Okay, let's try it. I mean, I think everything else was just passive and probably losing, so I'll try this. So now I think he's going to play g4. And it's a question, do I have enough tempi there? Hmm. Hmm. I don't know. I don't know about this. H six takes there, 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 there. Hmm. I think I'm gonna lose. But I'll try this. So he could take on f5. I'm just trying to prove that his pawns all stacked up here are not good, but in fact, he might win by a tempo. Because once he takes, he gets access to the e4 square uh, later on when I play king c5. So if he takes, I have to play f6, I think. Goes h4. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, I think that's just winning for him. He's going to play h5 next. I'll try this, but yeah, h5 followed by g5. I think that's over. Well, I was hoping for a study-like draw in the rook and pawn end game, but I <laughs> think that was a mirage. Yeah, this doesn't work. He's got too much of a breakthrough potential. Okay, I'll go back, but g5 is going to win. Okay, resign that. So, got outplayed in this one, went down a pawn in the middle game. And it looks like here I just have to move my knight rather than trade it, but uh, I am not liking my chances to hold this. He always has the possibility of creating outside pawn. He does have the four versus three in the center. I was dreaming of some situation where he takes on f5 and I play f6 and can just wait with my king. 
even that I'm not so sure about. Like, uh, let's say he does take, and I play f6, he goes h3. This is the line I thought he'd go for. h5, h4, now I have to move my king, so here. I was hoping I could maybe hold this position, but even this I would, I would doubt if it works, because he can start bringing his king over and then get a pass to a pawn. Yeah, this should also be winning. This b pawn's pretty fast. So on the whole, it looks like b5 was a mistake. And bishop takes d5 was a nice move by him to give me a weak pawn and then kind of capitalize on that with his activity. So maybe I should play either the direct knight c3 or just choose some different plan. I was just trying to avoid knight c3, queen e1, whereupon this knight is not stable yet. I was hoping that the, the pawn coming into b4 would stabilize it. But that's why these guys are 26, 2700s. I mean, they just find ways to pressure you at all times. So I went 0 for 3 against that class today, but um, on the whole, some positives as well. Now, let's take a look at what could be key games here. Okay, Andrew is doing well. I think um, looking like a draw against Fedoseev. Unless he's able to do something here. He's down a lot of time, but... Yeah, I don't think he'll he'll lose this. No way. Yeah, this is just a pretty simple draw. Let me put up the other game. Um, okay, there's the other two games are still in progress. So I'm going to click out of that. Let's bring up this one. This is Daniel Gurevich versus Darius Swirts. What is going on here? Wow. So Daniel has two rooks against black's queen and a very dangerous e-pawn. Very dangerous, because if black brings the knight back to block, then rook d8 is checkmate. So it looks like black has to try to do something with the checks. But the king can be relatively hidden. And is one threat here, rook d8 check, knight takes d8, then e7? Because if so, that would be incredible. <laughs> And black can't stop the e-pawn without giving up their queen. So, all right, we're going to pay attention to that game for sure. Just checking out Chan's game against uh, Duncan Shepard. Equal material, but Sean has a big time advantage. Three-minute time advantage. Okay, we'll come back to that one. I could put these up as tabs, but it kind of messes up my screen capture, so... I'm just going to do this. Yeah, this posi this game will be drawn. I'm almost certain. King here, take, take, take a7. That's an easy draw for Andrew. So let's pay attention to Gurevich's game. This is crunch time. Okay, so here's the big question. Is this move working? Check. Knight takes e7. And then black has to somehow check white. Because otherwise they're going to lose a decisive amount of material. So maybe he's going to take on h4 with check. But then just king f1. Maybe there's a situation where black could grab the knight and then after a promotion hide the king and black does have two pawns for the exchange. So that's that's not clear. Okay, Daniel's down to 20 seconds, less than 20 seconds. I think he almost has to go for e7, though. Well, no, he doesn't have to. I, sh I shouldn't say that. But if the knight moves, then black will get a chance to blockade. Or not e7, this move. And then e7, yeah. So he's going to go for it. And let's see what black has in mind against that.
Okay, so he's going to take. And probably king f1. No, g3. g3. Okay. Hmm. So if queen h2, just king f3. And that looks winning. So queen d4 might be forced. And then how best to get out of these checks? King g2 here. Yeah, and actually white can even play knight e4 there. And the strength of these two threats is going to win the game. There's some instances where white could even queen. And if black's queen is, say, on d7, take it. Then knight f6 and uh, win the, the knight on d8 at the end. I think Daniel's going to win this. G3 was a very nice move. Okay, granted, black can still play this. Yeah, of course, they can still play queen takes g5. I forgot about that. <laughs> okay, so the, there's still work to be done here, but I was just so impressed by g3, I forgot that this was also a possibility. Aha, uh -huh, but now this is coming into the position, playing for checkmate. Daniel is very good in time pressure. He's exceptional at keeping the, the pressure. Whoa, he's going to lose on time, though. I didn't realize how low he was. Hurry. Queen f5 coming. No g5. Okay. Oh, he's going to win the queen, I think. Yeah. Queen h7. Or mate. <laughs> oh, nice. Wow. Okay. Andrew's going crazy. Okay, that was a huge game. Now, um, I take it Andrew drew, so this is the game to watch now. And Sean just won a full piece. Yeah, okay. We win the match. We win the match against the pretty impressive um, St. Louis Archbishops. I mean, they've got a very impressive roster. And we weren't expecting to, uh, I think, win this match. We were outrated, but we knew we were going to fight. Awesome. Let me just confirm. But I'm pretty positive we, we took that. Unless Andrew lost that game somehow, because it was tied up going to the end. I lost. But Sean won. Daniel won. And it looks like Andrew drew. So my teammates came through huge. I didn't put in a great result this, this match. Just one out of four. Lost to all the higher rated players, but... Some clutch upsets by my teammates at the end. How did Sean win that piece? So when I last, last left off here, it looked like he was maybe better, but it didn't seem like anything was decided yet. Oh, so he, he maneuvered his bishop around. That was nice. And it looks like white blundered a key pawn. Rook b1, bishop takes f2. Fantastic. Okay, so our free agent acquisition comes up huge. Daniel Gurevich getting a win over Darius Swirch. And let's just check this one more time. Just waiting for that to update. There are four more matches coming up here, uh, including the Chengdu Pandas from China, who are a team to watch for sure. But yeah, the other division is about to start. Yeah, I think this will be updated any second, but if we didn't win somehow, I'll post in the comments to let you guys know, but I'm 99% certain we got that match. So anyways, thank you guys for watching this. Uh, I don't know if I'll be doing this in the future, commentating and playing, because as you can see, that's pretty tough. And, you know, I'd like to be able to focus as much as possible and commentary does get in the way, but I thought it'd be a nice thing to do, especially since you guys were so supportive in getting us into the league in the first place. So thank you guys again, those of you who voted for the Minnesota Blizzard in that poll a couple months ago. And watch out for us this year. We just got a really big result right there. I know the St. Louis Archbishops are one of the teams that were um, kind of slated to do very well in this league, and they probably will. But getting a, a full point in the match standings against them right in the first match is, is huge for us. All right, guys. Well, thanks a lot. And let me know. Leave me some feedback. And I'll talk to you guys again soon. Bye.